Hello, my name is Nicholas and welcome to the Wolfram Tech Conference. I'm a math content developer with the Wolfram Alpha Math Group and a PhD candidate finishing up at Indiana University, wherein my research focuses on graph-based percolation theory in the Wolfram language with application to the collapse of viruses. So among the other 12 talks I'm sure you're attending today, we'll be discussing percolation theory with applications to the collapse of viruses. So I will gloss over the abstract, give you a chance to pause if you're watching the video and the web deployment later and read it if you so choose. And I'll take the opportunity to thank my current collaborator, Professor Ryden Twarek at the University of York for ongoing mentorship and collaboration and past experimental collaborators in the Zlotnik lab at IU for experimentally validating a few of the predictions I'll present today. So an overview of percolation theory, it's a mathematical approach to modeling a variety of phenomena that involve connectivity of agents in a given system. So it's used to model, say, fluid flow through random porous media, and a large swath of phenomena modeled with network theory, such as assessing the robustness to random or targeted attack or failure in, say, an electrical grid or a traffic flow network, et cetera. We'll go through a few of these sequentially. On the left, you have a two-dimensional cubic lattice, wherein 50% of the sites are occupied or blocked, those are the black cells, and 50% are unoccupied, the white cells. If you were attempting to, as a fluid, flow from the left side to the right side of the system, you would be able to, because of the third row being entirely white cells, there's the opportunity to percolate from the left to the right side. However, you can imagine as we observe different random instantiations of some fractional occupancy of a lattice like this, if we increase the fraction of occupied black cells from 50% to say 70%, there's a high probability that one of those additional occupied cells will land in that third row, such that it forms a blockade or a blockage and fluid is no longer able to percolate through that system. The study of connectivity as a function of random occupation fraction or deletion fraction is the inverse, is the study of percolation theory. And it depends upon the topology of this lattice. Is it a cubic lattice? Is it a hexagonal lattice, etc.? You'll see a 3D equivalent of that in the center where we have a 3D cubic lattice wherein you'd study percolation from say left to right, top to bottom, et cetera. Again, studying the connectivity from side to side or the connectivity of the entire lattice depending on your application. In particular, you'll notice in the 3D equ equivalent here that there is a vertex at the center of each lattice site. This vertex represents the lattice site itself, whereas the edges between the vertices represent connectivity of the lattice sites. So the two formalisms to describe percolation theory numerically are lattices and by graph lattice duality, graphs or networks. So stripping away the lattice formalism because the Wolfram language is, contains rather wolf, uh, graph theory functionality, we'll use the graph theory formalism where in an example with that, if we generate a random graph here and take that to be representative of, say, an electrical grid, there's a central hub in the electrical grid, and then a couple individuals that, like you always have, are off-grid, insist on that at times, and then some individuals who are perhaps in a rural area where they're connected, but only weakly so, to the central hub. Notice for those individuals in particular, if say the upper rightmost leaf here, where there are three individuals that are weakly connected to the hub by an intermediary who's in the center. If that intermediary were to fail or become disconnected, the other three individuals in that right uppermost leaf would also become disconnected. This investigation of the connectivity within a network and its robustness to say random failures of components or targeted attack of components by some adversarial entity, for example, is an important consideration in the design of these engineered networks. So it's important to know that if one component fails, a large, a whole street is not gonna lose power, for example. So we will look at percolation theory with application to a less common system, 
which is in physical virology, the disassembly of viral shells. So a virus's shell, which is shown on the left for, I believe, hepatitis B virus, the source is below. This is a protein sur surface representation of the regularly tiled shell that protects viruses while they're in transit between hosts. So if someone coughs, the virus is going to spend some amount of time outside of anyone's body in suboptimal conditions. And its genome is very fragile. Its enzymes and other transcription uh, machinery is very fragile. And it needs to be kept together as the cargo of this shell. and needs to be protected by the exterior of the shell. And so these things can survive often for a week or more on a given surface because of the protection of this viral shell that encloses them. And we'll study the physics of this virus shell or the topology of this virus shell. So these virus shells form very regular lattices made out of repeating individual components called subunits. So you can see that the spike tips emerging from in the leftmost figure, the red spike tips emerging from the surface are in a fairly regular array. There are a lot of hexagonal patterns here and the array is very regular. It's not just a random amalgamation of Legos, for example. It's a very regular system of repeating tiles. If we move to the right, to the center, the protein surface has been made transparent, and the underlying po polygonal structure, the rhombic tiling, is is outlined along with its dual graph. If we then strip from that the protein representation and stick with the abstract polyhedral representation on the right, you can see very clearly that this is a highly regular tiled lattice. And it is amazing, an amazing feat of biology that these subunits, when they're made in mass quantities individually in the cell upon infection, are able to spontaneously assemble into one of these blueprints. And it follows one of these blueprints precisely. And so, a viral capsid is a regular tiling of, for about half a species, a sphere with repeated subunits in a specific geometric arrangement. And this can be represented by either the polyhedral tiling, the lattice, or the, the dual graph by graph lattice duality, wherein subunits are represented by a vertex and the bonds holding the subunits together are represented by edges. So we'll study the disassembly of these viruses because both assembly, as I mentioned, and disassembly of viruses is key to the viral life cycle. And a simple and experimentally realized model of disassembly is just the random removal of subunits. So in the same way we had random fractional occupancy or random fractional deletion in the cubic lattice in the initial example, in this spherical lattice, we have random occupancy or random subunit removal for disassembly of virus shells. This specifically is continuing our hepatitis B virus example. And you can see predictions that we've made using these models that I'll highlight more clearly in a moment in the uppermost reference here, the theory reference, wherein we made certain predictions. And in an experimental paper where the, this specific random subunit dissociation model was realized and the predictions were experimentally verified. So we'll go through those a little bit more systematically after a mathematical generalization. So the disassembly of viruses consists of removing some fraction of its subunits and studying the product that remains. So as physicists and mathematicians, we seek to generalize things. The previous examples have been with hepatitis B virus. That was in the previous paper. I have a collaborator, Raiden Twarak, at the University of York, who has deduced that there are Archimedean design principles that dictate that there are exactly three types of lattices that may be constructed out of a single type of subunit. These lattices are exemplified in species such as Periacotovirus, which has a triangular tiling, A, on the left, tobacco ring virus, which has a kite tiling, B, in the middle, and bacteriophage MS2 and hepatitis B virus, which has a rhombic tiling exemplified in C on the right. And the topology of these networks, for example, the subunit valency, the number of bonds connected to each uh, subunit, the arrangement of subunits in the larger lattice beyond local connectivity, 
The topology of these subunit bond networks determines their robustness against fragmentation. So how many pieces can I remove before this thing falls apart? That is determined by the topology of the lattice in part. You'll notice that, and we'll come back to this, the triangular tiling on the left, the rhombic tiling on the right are both fundamentally consistent of triangular components. The rhombic tiling is essentially each rhombus is two triangles. The triangle tiling, clearly each subunit is one triangle. We'll come back to the ability of these lattices to be further triangulated such that they can scale in size by adding more and more pieces, but still adhering to the overall triangular or rhombic trend in a moment. So the topology of this lattice determines the propensity for fragmentation and the robustness against fragmentation. So if we want to determine for any one of these tilings or all of these tilings, the fragmentation characteristics, one of the most telling metrics in this case, and the one that is experimentally detectable, is the fragmentation threshold. This fragmentation threshold is the fraction of vertices that, when removed, induces fragmentation of the remaining structure. And so the subunits are randomly removed at some fraction on the x-axis in this plot. The connection probability on the y-axis is determined through Monte Carlo. And the point at which these connection probabilities for each lattice transcend 0 0.5 is the point at which, on average, the system has gone from breaking up into two or fewer components to two or more components. So this is the point at which the system is, on average, fragmented. And so I'll go through the technique briefly, since this is a Wolfram language talk of using vertex delete with a graph representation of the lattice, as we highlighted, wherein you use a table function to iterate over the x-axis variable using vertex delete, operating on the graph of your choice here. And because you need to Monte Carlo this for each point, say you run 100,000, a million, 10 million replicates, the automatic parallelism within Mathematica, the Wolfram language, excuse me, is capable of expeditiously generating the millions of points you need to do Monte Carlo here. So, oh, lag. <laughs> so, we'll notice that we've predicted the fragmentation threshold for each of the three systems here. Triangular, which is the weakest, rhombic, which is the central, and kite, which is the most robust. And you notice that triangular had a valency or a vertex degree of three. You might anticipate this would lead to, and maybe even be the dominant factor, in determining whether or not the system is robust to disassembly, just the, simply the number of bonds holding the system together. And indeed, the triangular tiling is the weakest. However, the distance between in terms of the difference between their uh, fragmentation thresholds, the difference between rhombic tilings, which have a valency of four, and triangular tilings, which have a valency of three, is about the same as the distance between rhombic tilings with a valency of four and kite tilings with a valency of four. So the contribution, just a qualitative guess from this plot, the contribution from topology beyond simple local valency is pretty significant because if it weren't, the propensity for disassembly of the rhombic tiling and the kite tiling would be comparable. So for each of these three viral blueprints, we've determined the fragmentation threshold. And each species of virus has to utilize, if it has only one single type of subunit, one of these three viral archetypes. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There aren't just three cases. There are three archetypes, two of which can be extended in size, as we discussed. So the triangular tiling, as is illustrated here from the left to the right, a triangular tiling can be further triangulated. This is why, for example, you have the Triforce in Zelda. It's four triangles composing one larger triangle. This ability to further triangulate a spherical surface lends itself to 
size scalability in the number of subunits and often in the physical size of a given shell, despite having f very small individual subunits. So if a viral species finds itself with a very large genome over the course of evolution, it will need a larger viral shell to protect it, to contain it, than a species that has a smaller genome. However, there are only three archetypes you can choose from. And so it needs to choose one of the archetypes that can be scaled in size re readily, such that it can contain its genome and protect it in transit between hosts. This scalability and size is allowable in two of the three archetypes, triangular tilings and rhombic tilings. The fragmentation threshold depends predominantly upon the topology of the individual uh, bl blueprint. However, it also depends on the size of the lattice in question, such that one triangular tiling on the left, for example, will have a higher fragmentation threshold than a tiling on, say, the right. Before we move on to illustrate this more quantitatively, I want to highlight how easy it is to make these polyhedra in the Wolfram language, wherein you can just generate one of these triangular tilings by using the nth order geodesation of fundamental graphics primitives, polyhedral primitives, such as an icosahedron or a, a dodecahedron, wherein the leftmost figure here was generated as the second order geodesation of the icosahedron. You can then use some functionality that I believe is becoming more and more native to the kernel in order to generate from this polyhedral representation a graph. I ended up writing those myself because it's not terribly challenging, but I, I think that in version 12, some of this functionality became native to generate the 3D graph that you need to actually do this percolation stuff from the polyhedral representation. So there's a size dependence of the fragmentation threshold for any one of the three categories, or rather two of them that are capable of being scaled in size. To represent this more quantitatively, we have a slew of predictions for experiments, only a small fraction of which have been experimentally validated so far. These two, all, th all of the data that we've collected on fragmentation thresholds for those three archetypes capable of being made out of a single type of subunit is presented here on the left for subunit fragmentation thresholds, wherein each point is the fragmentation threshold for that on the x-axis triangulation number, which is a scaling of how many subunits make up that make up the capsid. So a triangular lattice with say t value of three, which is what we've been studying so far in this talk, has fewer subunits than one with a triangulation number of say t equals 36. And for the two archetypes that are capable of being scaled in size, this fragmentation decreases from the baseline values set by the topology of the blueprint. And this size dependence is from, in part, a propensity to exclude singlets, an increasing propensity to exclude singlets as the size of the system is scaled upwards. Similarly, something we haven't discussed, bond percolation is also heavily investigated in these systems, wherein instead of randomly removing subunits, you randomly remove some fraction of the bonds holding the subunits together and then investigate the propensity for the system to fragment. And so you can determine in the same way we were determining in the left plot, the fraction of subunits that leads to on average fragmentation. You can compute the fraction of bonds whose removal on average leads to fragmentation. And as fairly similar behavior, even the magnitudes of the number are fairly similar. However, in the leftmost system, at least one of the points has been experimentally detected. So the, per, the fragmentation threshold of hepatitis B virus has been detected experimentally in one of our collaborator, a paper with a collaborator that was cited earlier. However, none of the other fragmenta fragmentation thresholds, subunit fragmentation thresholds or bond thresholds have been detected yet. The success of the modeling technique for hepatitis B virus's subunit fragmentation threshold would lend one to think that this is a great opportunity for experimentalists to detect the other points on these graphs, the other fragmentation thresholds, subunit and bond that exist. So if you're an experimentalist and you happen to work on other systems, other species of virus, and it realizes one of these other single subunit blueprints at a given size, 
you may be able to design an experiment to see if fragmentation occurs when a given fraction of the subunits or bonds are deleted. So the fragmentation threshold is not the entire story. If you have dedicated and precise, say single particle technique detection ex experimentation equipment, you can detect fragment size distributions, theoretically, such that you can show that the, in say the top left case, which these are organized with respect to on the top subunit fragmentation products and bond fragmentation products, and the way we were discussing on the previous slide, and, the, and then A, B, and C are the three different archetypes, and then D, E, and F are the bond equivalents for the three different archetypes. So if we take the exemplary case on the top left, the blue distribution is where you've removed only 10% of the subunits from the shell, which is well below the fragmentation threshold, such that the system is largely still unfragmented. And therefore you get, for the most part, a binomial distribution of products, where if on average you were missing 10%, there will be at times with a, any random algorithm a time where you're missing say 112% uh, versus 8% or 14% and 6% such that it averages out to 10% with a binomial distribution. This binomial distribution decreases at the peak due to the increasing propensity for fragmentation by the time you move to the pink distribution at 20%. And you can see that it's spread out. The CDF shown as the line is more spread out to represent the peak distribution yet it's still predominantly a binomial distribution because we're a few percent below the fragmentation threshold. However, if you increase 10% further to what should be the green distribution here, you don't see a green distribution binomially because it's, we're at 30% removal and the fragmentation threshold was, I believe about 21, 22% for this system, the triangular lattice. So instead of seeing any binomial distribution here because of fragmentation, you see no intermediate sizes at all you just see a bunch of fragmented products at size of 10 subunits or fewer. So this is a hallmark of percolation theory generally that as you approach the, either the fragmentation threshold or the less rigid percolation threshold, you rapidly go from having a connected whole to nothing but a slew of small disconnected fragments. There's not often a situation where if you have a 60 subunit structure, you remove 30 pieces, you'll have two size 15 structures left, or you have a 60 subunit structure, you remove 20 pieces, you'll have two 20 piece structures left. The probability of that is very low but due to the random removal, and you instead have a slew of smaller products. And so you anticipate experimentally as you're titrating in, so to speak, in the number of deleted subunits, the stoichiometry of the passivated subunits in the previous experiment I was referencing, as you're titrating in the fraction of subunits removed, you're going to rapidly lose signal for anything of significant size as you approach this fragmentation threshold. These distributions I've shown here are likely to be skewed by other effects. We're only considering topology here. We're not considering thermodynamics and we're not considering time dependence, the gradual breakup of these things if they're weakly bound. However, even for weakly bound systems, in the hepatitis B virus case where contacts are simply hydrophobic instead of covalent, even in the weakly bound case, we observe fairly precisely the predicted topological fragmentation threshold. So that these effects are not expected to nullify the results, the predictions made here. So in conclusion, you can predict in a molecular game of Jenga, if you're familiar with the North American board game, the percolation theory fragmentation threshold of virus capsids, depending on the viral blueprint that is employed. There are a fairly finite number of viral blueprints that viruses can use due to mathematical constraints. We have predicted the fragmentation threshold for each of the viruses blueprints that are capable of being made out of a single type of subunit. And so this is an opportunity for experimentalists to go out and detect all of the non-hepatitis B virus thresholds and the bond threshold of hepatitis B virus.
I'll take a moment to highlight the simplicity of this modeling technique relative to the other modeling techniques used in the field. The established modeling techniques used in physical virology tend to be reaction kinetics, which are time-dependent differential equations with a very coarse-grained representation of thermodynamics, essentially one or a few parameters, a delta G constant, for example. These systems are fairly simple. However, they do require time dependence, consideration of kinetics, and thermodynamic considerations. More complicated systems still, with more explicit representation of these phenomena, are molecular dynamics simulations, wherein you have implicit time dependence by virtue of running the simulation, represented by the propagation of explicit energies specified between entities in the simulation, and thermodynamics in the given ensemble that you're working in. These systems are both fairly complicated in that they have time dependence, they have thermodynamic dependence, they have energetics dependence. That is ignored in the percolation theory model. Percolation theory is a vastly simpler topological only model, which is still capable of making robust predictions. And because of this simplicity, you can do this entirely in the Wolfram language, expeditiously due to parallelism of the system. So you can use a graph theory formalism to model percolation of lattices or graph systems and do so expeditiously because of the automatic parallelism in the Wolfram language. I'm happy to answer any questions. If you'd like to ask a quick question after the talk, I've probably gone over a little bit on time, such that we can also schedule a breakout meeting if you prefer. Or you can email me at my email and brunk at wolfram.com. Thank you. So can you guys hear me? You sound good. Okay. So uh, Dave asked, <clears throat> excuse me, Dave asked if uh, virus capsules tend to fail without fragmentation by simply opening and leaking. Uh, it depends on what the size of the molecules in question are. And so if, if you consider the uh, protein diagram of the protein representation of the virus shell, those are naturally, um, some species are naturally porous to small molecules, such that say like drugs, ligands, et cetera, uh, small molecules can go in and out of the virus shell. Uh, generally larger stuff, like the stuff the virus cares about containing, for example, the genome, et cetera, take up the majority of the space in the virus shell. And uh, it's not porous to those. And uh, I'm primarily a physicist, not a biologist, so I won't pretend to have you know, as much expertise as my experimental collaborators or as my uh, collaborator at the University of York. Uh, but my understanding of these virus shells is that a, a lot of them have specific engineering to prevent opening and leaking at the wrong time. Like some of them have uh, portal proteins and some of them have molecular motors that are designed to, through these portals, uh, actively put work in to pump the genome in or release the genome such that uh, you don't have to have porosity or active disassembly as we studied in this talk in order to release the genome or encapsulate the genome. Uh, these viruses will, uh, in terms of general failure, they're remarkably robust. Like uh, depending on the species, I, th I think, and you know, I haven't done research on this, COVID is, uh, you know, it will survive on a surface for several days at least is, m is my understanding of what I've read uh, just in popular science stuff. Uh, there, I have heard of experiments with other virus species where these things will remain stable on the on uh, in te a test tube, for example, for weeks or months, uh, often not even exchanging subunits with the environment transiently. Uh, so I hope that goes at least you know a quarter of the way towards answering your question to some extent. Uh, it depends a lot on the virus species, how porous it is, how prone to failure it is in what time frame, whether or not that failure is random subunit removal or targeted removal, uh, et cetera. Uh, biology is amazingly complicated and uh, I can't speak to it much more than uh, the general assessment I've given here. Are there any other uh, questions? In the event there aren't questions, I do have uh, an example, like a do-it-yourself kind of example that I've cooked up. Uh, I'll upload. So let me share my screen here. Also interrupt me if you have a targeted question. <clears throat> 
Oh, okay. Uh, how do I unmute someone? Let me unshare my screen so that we can discuss your question. If you have a question, uh, click the raise hand button uh, and then we can promote you so that you can talk. Yeah, just like that. Okay, so have we, have we enabled him to? I didn't know you had to unmute. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, very nice talk, Nick. Uh, very thoughtful and very uh, well presented. Congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm intrigued and, and I can't elaborate any more on, on the stuff inside the shell, but if you imagine the, uh, the, the subunits mm -hmm. as wiggling around or moving and only being rigid when they are connected to enough additional subunits next to them, mm -hmm. then you might imagine that if a subunit was connected to uh, only one other subunit, it, it might wiggle more, so to speak. Um, right. Eventually, a long string of subunits wouldn't probably maintain a, a spherical geometry. It would probably unfold a little bit, if you wish. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. One one of the really amazing things about these uh, virus shells is that yeah, all of the entropic effects, the thermodynamic effects, are all counteracting the precise self-assembly into a uniform shell. And so uh, I've heard other people. You know, I can't claim credit for this analogy, but assembling these shells in the first place without an active, you know, a active a person actually assembling them it is an amazing feat. Similar to if you just threw up a handful of cards, a deck of cards, and then it fell and assembled a house of cards. Uh, the extent to which it has to counteract those entropic effects is, is pretty amazing. And uh, I have a colleague whose entire PhD project is to uh, model the molecular dynamics of the assembly of those pieces such that if you have a box where a bunch of the pieces are coming together, they will gradually form at first, say, a planar structure like you were describing, and then gradually it start to induce a radius of curvature and then close the shell. And uh, one of the main challenges in her work has been to counteract those entropic forces you're describing, where uh, you know it's difficult to get the bond geometry correct, the interfacial geometry between the subunits correct, such that it wants to form a sphere instead of, say, just a glob, right? And uh, so, yeah, that's absolutely a, a valid uh, point. And yeah, molecular dynamics simulation, people struggle with that. And uh, it's ama amazing that nature has figured out how to assemble these things within a matter of seconds uh, into the precise lattice that, they, that it, it assembles. So, uh, another thought um, would, would have to do with, say, a, a planar model. Um, you have subunits like hexagons that, that form larger groups or islands of hexagons. Mm -hmm. um, if, if hexagons like to be near other hexagons, then just like small droplets of oil would coalesce into larger droplets of oil if sitting on a, a water surface. I, that's kind of my mental model for how this self-assembly of, of viral subunits or protein subunits of any type occurs. So that if you delete one and then delete another one elsewhere, it seems to me that one of those subunits might just sort of shift itself to fill in one of the holes and leave the other a double hole, if that makes sense. Right. So uh, that, that's a very good way of picturing uh, this generally. Hydrophobic forces are what leads to a, uh, aggregation of oil so that it wants to minimize the interfacial surface area. And in, in the same way, there are hydrophobic surfaces on the subunit edges that when these things come together, the hydrophobic surfaces bury one another and hide one another from the solvent, such that you don't have that energy penalty of solvent exposed hydrophobic surfaces between the subunits. And so uh, that's a very good way of thinking about it. And uh, generally self-assembly is driven by uh, subunit, subunit bonds that are on the order of about four kBT of energy, such that uh, if one kBT is the standing thermal free energy, the extent to which stuff is jiggling, it needs about a bond of bond strength of four kBT to hold it together to counteract the jiggling away from each other. Uh, the reason that, that that is effective beyond simply say fourfold is because these things are say trivalent or tetravalent. So, so that if they're trivalent and they're four kBT of energy per bond, and this thing taking the, my hand to be the subunit, this thing has a bond here, bond here, bond here, and then bond here for a tetravalent subunit. 
then as these things come together in a lattice, they have, in that case, 16 kBT of energy. And that's a considerable uh, thermodynamic barrier to dissociation or even rearrangement, such that if you had, say, a lattice tiled like this, and you removed one piece from, say, the center here, and then the other one had a surrounding three pieces, it still has 12 kBT of energy holding it in place. And so that prohibits rearrangement to some extent. And then uh, in the experimental setup, we had uh, in one of the papers I highlighted there, they were actually covalent bonds, each of which are more on the order of 50 kBT of energy, in which case you have 150 kBT holding those things in place. And so these things are surprisingly rigid. Uh, experiments have been done with, I think, hepatitis B virus, but I wouldn't quote me on that, showing that... Uh, if you have a fully assembled shell and it sits in a test tube, these things will uh, not even exchange, so, like a subunit won't fall out and another one joins in for months. You know, the, the, the ability for 16, 20, 24, or 150 kBT of energy holding the subunits in place essentially counteracts even transient exchange of subunits, let alone the, the rearrangement or falling apart of the whole thing. And uh, yeah, so they're amazingly robust for you know, just soft little proteins. And, uh, it, it actually makes you wonder how they can ever fall apart. Right, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think you can probably do simple like thermodynamic estimates of the time scale of dissociation, you know, and I know for like glass, forma glass formation and glass movement uh, in like a, a window pane or something, it's like 10 to the eighth, you know, days or something like that. Uh, it's probably not that high for these things, but yeah, it's amazingly high given the energetic barrier of the, uh, anything from that 16 to 150 or 200 kBT of energy. It's amazingly high given that it's an exponential dependence. The, the, uh, so if the uh, virus has to deliver its payload, how does it ever manage to dissociate to do that? There are a lot of different, uh, so this is like the random subunit removal is like the simplest model of that. There are some species employ targeted removal, in which case this model wouldn't apply to those species, at least insofar as the biological uh, disassembly goes. Uh, where they remove, say, if there's pent pentagonal components to the lattice and hexagonal components, the pentagonal components will actively rearrange upon some confirmation change in the subunit that's triggered by uh, a certain event in the viral life cycle. Uh, so biology has figured out engineering tricks where it will do a confirmational switch or something to such that targeted removal occurs, in which case this, this model isn't applicable to that. And uh, uh, there... There's a variety of different approaches that yeah, biology will figure out. In some cases, they use motor proteins to actually remove the uh, genome itself without ever actually dissociating the capsid at all. And so the, there are certainly species to which this doesn't apply uh, biologically. Uh, however, with nanotechnology, where you can actually engineer the system to do certain things like random subunit removal, like in the experiments we were highlighting, this is more applicable. And uh, yeah, the, the number of tricks biology has figured out and the, and the biologists have figured out that biology has engineered are amazing. And uh, I can't speak to it as much as I would like, uh, but I'm happy to, I think we're gonna get kicked out of here in like one minute. I think Pathwell has a, a cutoff. So if you would like you to meet. Nick, thank you again. It was a neat talk. I liked it. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone. I hope you enjoy the tail end of the tech conference.